in the depth of our grand, unfathomable cosmos, elder conspiracies permeate countless light years of dark void between the stars. Their designs, alien to our reckoning, can only be expressed by our feeble minds as madness. Welcome to Call of Cthulhu, a game where the whole universe tries to kill you, or at the very least, settle with driving you miserably and hopelessly insane. If you want to experience the true nerd power fantasy, where your library use skill can help save the world, then take a seat and make yourself comfy, because this game is for you. Ah uh, yes, the good old Dewey Decimal System. Big Green won't even know what hit him. Hi everyone, CJ here, aka the Tabletop RPG Shrek, presenting you the How to Play Call of Cthulhu Tabletop RPG Tutorial Series. This tutorial covers the 7th edition of the game, the latest edition, which went on print in 2016. This is the introductory video of the series. I'm going to cover the general rules and explain what Call of Cthulhu and tabletop RPGs are about. Referring to the episode map on screen, you can see that I have divided the episodes into separate sections. If you want to be able to join a game already knowing most of the terms and rules, you just need to watch the video in the basic rules category. Then, once you got the hang of the basic rules, you can create your own characters with the character creation episode. The advanced rules category will cover you if you are playing in a longer campaign. And finally, if you want to step up to the plate and run Call of Cthulhu for your friends, you can catch the final episode which is how to run Call of Cthulhu. So without further ado, let's dive into the madness and learn this game. I know that many of you who are subscribed to the channel are pretty savvy about tabletop RPGs. So I'm asking you to bear with me while I explain the terms and concepts that you may already know. Because this video is intended for everyone, even complete beginners who have never even heard of tabletop RPGs before. A tabletop RPG or tabletop role-playing game is neither a board game nor a video game. It is a game played by players who assume the role of investigators in an imaginary game world narrated and moderated by a keeper. The generic name for this role is Game Master. But in Call of Cthulhu, this role is called the Keeper of Arcane Lore, or Keeper for short. So don't get confused if I use these terms interchangeably. You don't need any electronics to play this game. All you need are just some pen, paper, polyhedral dice, and of course, the rules. If you have seen certain episodes of popular TV shows such as Stranger Things, Community, or popular web groups such as Critical Role and Acquisitions Incorporated, then you have seen people play tabletop RPGs before. There are many different types of tabletop RPGs out there, each with different rules and themes. Some are themed around fantasy, sword and sorcery, but there are others based on samurais, cyberpunks, vampires, etc. Call of Cthulhu is named after H.P. Lovecraft's horror short story. Unsurprisingly, its theme is centered around humanity's feeble attempt to resist against the forces of incomprehensible cosmic horrors, derived from the Cthulhu mythos. Even if you don't encounter the big calamari himself, don't be disappointed. There are plenty of terrible things from the Pantheon that will savage you physically and mentally. Call of Cthulhu is the Dark Souls of tabletop RPG before Dark Souls was even a thing. It is supposed to be tough. Classically, it is set in America, during the Roaring Twenties, which coincided with the Prohibition era, the same era depicted in H.P. Lovecraft's novels. However, there are supplements that let you play in other eras, such as the Second World War, Achtung Cthulhu, Vietnam War era, Delta Green, Roman times, modern day, and many more. But for this series, I will stick with the stylish 1920s. The first edition of Call of Cthulhu was released in 1981, and over the years it was constantly revised and refined, and now we have the seventh edition, which went to print in 2016. 
so it's got quite a lot of years ahead of it and it is definitely worth learning now. Call of Cthulhu also happens to be one of the easier games to learn how to play, which makes it great for complete beginners. Here is a quick description of how a game would transpire. Someone assumes the role of a keeper, in this case it would be me. The keeper narrates the story, roleplay supporting characters extra or enemies, also known as NPCs, create challenges for the players, and also moderate the rules. Keepers can create stories and challenges themselves or just buy published scenarios for convenience. Other people assume the role of players. In general, you would want three or more players, but having too many players makes it hard to manage, especially for novice keepers. Generally, having four to five players is a good balance. The players then roleplay as investigators. These are characters they have created or characters provided by the scenario. Many published scenarios have pre-created investigators that suit the challenges in the scenario. So they are pretty handy, especially if you are playing with beginners or planning for one-off sessions. Before I proceed, let me clarify what the terms session, scenario, and campaign mean. A session is an instance where the players meet to play Call of Cthulhu. A session can take anywhere up to an hour or more. It really depends on the availability of the players. Three to four hours is pretty standard for experienced and committed players. But for complete beginners, you might want to start with one to two hours because longer games may seem intimidating for novice players. If we use the TV series analogy, a scenario is like an episode with a resolution that can be finished in one or two sessions, or perhaps more if it is a long scenario. A campaign is like a season of TV show or short completed series. It is made up of multiple scenarios or chapters. There is no standardized length, so it is really up to your keeper how long they will make it last. For this series, I have prepared some example investigators for the players. You can download them and use them as reference as you watch along. Even though they are called investigators, it doesn't mean that they are detectives. Lucille, for example, is a wealthy trust fund thrill seeker. She is somewhat of a dilettante. Scott is a naive young sailor who unwittingly stumbled upon cultist conspiracy. Phineas is a wealthy and serious-minded entrepreneur who had experienced the corrupting nature of these cosmic horror firsthand. Rosalind, widow of the celebrated antiquarian Riccardo Lombardi, is a highly skilled antiquarian herself. These investigator statistics are written on their respective investigator sheet. Their basic characteristics like strength, intelligence, and dexterity are placed on top of the sheet. These are important numbers, but what's more important than these are their skills because whenever possible, I, the keeper, will ask you to use your investigator skills instead of characteristics. For example, our young sailor, Scott, was working on deck. But as he was working, the sight of a lone girl standing on a pier caught his attention. He was so captivated, he did not even realize that his big and mean supervisor was coming to inspect his work. So I asked Scott's player, Will, to make a listen roll with his corresponding skill. Now this is where players have to use their polyhedral dice. They are specialized gaming dice that looks like these. You've got the good old six-sided dice, but there are other funny shaped dice with different numbers of sides. The smallest one is a pyramid shaped four-sided dice called D4. Four-sided dice, D4, it is an easy pattern to remember. The six-sided dice is called D6. Sometimes the game requires you to roll a three-sided dice, D3, like for the investigator's unarmed attack damage. Without having to buy the super rare three-sided dice, you can use the D6 dice as substitute. All you need to do is to just divide the roll number by two and round up the result. This eight-sided dice is D8. Don't confuse it with a 10-sided D10 because it is quite easy to tell them apart. If you look at the D10 from the top, it looks like a circle, while the D8 is squarish. There are two types of 10-sided dice. One is your ordinary D10, the other comes in 10s. This is called 10s 10. Together, they are used as the percentile dice. By combining the two roll results, you can generate numbers from 1 to 100. If you get the double zeros on the 10s 10 die, 
and 1 on the D10, it means that your result is 1. Double zero and 7 means 7. 20 and 5 is 25. And 80 and 0 means 80. However, there is a special rule. If you get all zeros, it actually means 100. Similarly, if you are using a D10 on its own and you rolled a 0, your result is actually 10. Lastly, you have got the 12-sided D12 and 20-sided D20. Some new players may confuse these two dice, but you can easily tell the difference by looking at any of the surfaces. D12 has pentagon-shaped faces and D20 has triangle-shaped faces. The percentile dice is used for almost every dice roll from skill rolls to sanity rolls, and the other dice are usually used for damage rolls, sanity loss, and a few other rare functions. So whenever you are unsure of what to roll, assume that you are rolling the percentile dice. Okay, now back to Scott. I have previously asked the player to make a listen roll. Scott's listen skill is 40. To succeed this skill test, he has to roll the percentile dice and get a result equal or lower than his skill. This may feel counterintuitive at first, but it makes sense. The higher his skill is, the easier it is to roll under and succeed. Anyway, let's roll the percentile dice. Oh look, we have rolled 38. It is a success. Scott heard his supervisor coming in just in time and returned to work. So he didn't get admonished, but by the time his supervisor left him, he turned around and saw that the girl was no longer on the pier. There are different measures of success. If Scott had rolled under half of his skill, he would get a hard success. If he rolled under one-fifth, he would get extreme success, so he could potentially get proportionally better outcome for his success at the keeper's discretion. For example, if he had rolled an extreme success, he could have also heard her footsteps leaving the pier and got a clue for the direction she went by the sound of the puddle she stepped on. I will cover skill rolls in greater detail in the next episode, so let's move on. There are various categories of activities that the investigators can get involved in. Investigation and exploration, finding clues and getting into dangerous locations, the usual kind of things you would expect in Call of Cthulhu game, social situations where they have to turn on the charm and solve problems by talking, combat, in Call of Cthulhu, combat is a very hazardous affair. It is not uncommon for a character or enemies to be killed in one shot. It is best avoided unless necessary. Then there is also the chase, which Call of Cthulhu has a special rule for. Because you will have to do lots of strategic retreating, aka running, if you want to survive. Money and equipment is not an issue in this game. If it fits your character's occupation or personality, you can have it. Have all the guns you want. It will only entertain the malformed horror that's going to disembowel you if you rely on your trigger finger more than your head jelly. But death is merely one of your many concerns because losing your sanity will also put you out of the game. What makes Call of Cthulhu so great is that it always keeps the players on their toes. They will have to constantly weigh the risk of their actions. Can they handle the insanity-inducing truth or will they try to brute force their way to success? If they keep running away, they will leave the mystery unsolved and lose their sanity. But if they keep putting themselves in danger, they may just get themselves killed. At the end of a scenario or a campaign chapter, investigators may improve the skills they successfully used. More on this in future video. But in Call of Cthulhu, there is no such thing as level ups and hit point increases. So the game stays perpetually lethal. Don't be mistaken, the point of the game is not about being difficult. It is easy to run meat grinder campaign in any TRPG systems. The point of the danger is to encourage the players to overcome challenges through clever use of their skills and roleplay. You can see that there are dozens of skills on the investigator sheet. So use them wisely. Violence is but one of many possible methods of resolution. So don't forget, running away is always a viable option. And fire! Because fire solves everything. Anyway, that's the intro episode. Subscribe to the channel and press the bell button if you want to be notified when new episodes are released. 
And if you want to get the Call of Cthulhu rule books, consider helping the channel by using the affiliate links below. By the way, if you want this cool The Call of Cthulhu poster or related merchandise, you can find the link to the Redbubble store below. CJ, over and out.